Good evening, everyone. It's great to see the hall full for the first professorial inaugural lecture at UNSW of 2017. And um, of all the duties that I have as vice chancellor, this is one of the most joyous of those duties. It really is a privilege to hear these lectures and welcome our new professors. Before I go any further, I um, want to acknowledge the Bejical people, the traditional custodians of this land, pay my respects to elders past and present, and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are, are with us today. I also am delighted to welcome Professor Kemp's family, um, Penelope, Richard's wife, and Joseph and Francis Francesca, his children, it's great to have you here, even though you are students at the University of Sydney. <laughs> the generosity of UNSW knows absolutely no <laughs> limits. We may limit the amount of alcohol you can drink after this, this, this great occasion. Now, it really is, it really, really, really is a privilege to introduce these lectures. At UNSW, we have a bold, ambitious, altruistic, idealistic 2025 strategy, which is all about using the resource and the opportunity we have. And actually, you look out of that window and you see the fantastic mall, the, the infrastructure we have, the great people, the great students, great academics. It's all about using that to have a positive impact on people's lives in Sydney, in Australia, and around the world. And how do we do that? Well, we, we do it by organizing our university very well, by doing all of the things, you, putting all the things you need to put in place to help people thrive. But abs the absolute key is to have stellar academic leaders. And our professors are at the heart of everything we achieve. So these professorial lectures, and this is the first of this year, there will be many others following. They are a celebration of great achievement. And one of the things that I really enjoy about them is that they're an opportunity to hear about the new professor's life, not just their great academic work, but their great academic work put in the context of the people who influenced them, the people they're grateful to, the people that mentored them, and to hear all that put together, weaved together in, in a way that is often so memorable and, and you hear unexpected things. In addition to that, of course, we're going to hear some fascinating things, and I, I don't, I'm going to let Professor Peter Lovebond introduce Richard in a moment properly, but yeah, this is a fascinating area, cognitive and forensic psychology. Um, so many really interesting aspects here related to forensic medicine, psychiatry, law, criminology, psychology. I'm really, really looking forward to this lecture. So I'm going to stop there. I welcome you all to UNSW, to our first inaugural lecture, and I'm going to ask Professor Peter Lovebond, who is the Deputy Dean of the Faculty, to do a proper introduction to Professor Richard Kemp. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. I'm uh, delighted to represent the Faculty of Science at this professorial lecture, especially so because Richard Kemp is a member of my own school, the School of Psychology. I've uh, known Richard and his family for quite a long time now, and uh, we've had a number of adventures together. On uh, one occasion, for example, we threw our children into a fast-flowing tidal river in Patonga, <laughs> not because we didn't like them, but because we thought that they'd enjoy it, which they did. And having survived the experience, they grew up into fine young adults. And uh, as the Vice Chancellor just mentioned, Richard's uh, two, John and Francesca, are here with us today. And Francesca's partner, Sam, as well. And Penelope, welcome uh, all of you. Let me tell you a little bit about Richard's academic background. Richard obtained his BSc from Durham University and his PhD from the University of London. And after working in London and in Leicester for a number of years, he made the wise decision to come to UNSW in 2001. Richard works in human memory and perception and applies that knowledge to problems in the forensic context, including face recognition, eyewitness memory, police interviewing, and uh, forensic science evidence. He's collaborated with a number of organizations, including uh, government agencies, judicial bodies of one sort and another, 
police, banks and so on. And he's provided expert evidence in court cases in Australia and overseas. He's regularly asked to address conferences of judges, lawyers, police and other legal professionals. In more traditional scientific terms, he's published more than 80 journal articles and since 2001 has been awarded over $3 million in research funding. Richard's current projects, which I hope he's about to tell us more about, include passport fraud, CCTV identification and body cameras. Richard's been director of the Master of Forensic Psychology program for the past 10 years here at UNSW. And through his teaching, his research and his supervision, he's been a passionate and effective advocate for the role that psychological research can play in informing legal policy and practice. He's also a keen sailor, a past surf lifesaver, and an all-round good guy. Please welcome Richard Kemp. <laughs> Let's start with the important stuff. Thank you very much uh, for this. Um, I have to say this is actually quite a nerve-wracking experience, partly because of the brief, which is an unusual brief for an academic. I was thinking about why do I feel quite nervous giving this talk? I think it's the notion that you, to some extent, have to talk about yourself. And academics, I think, are very good at talking about just about anything except for themselves. It also occurred to me after a while that there's another reason I was nervous about this talk, and it's because I'm breaking a promise to my friend John, who is the, I was going to say the guy with the long hair. We all have long hair in these photographs. <laughs> John's the one that's sitting at the back of a climbing hut uh, on the island of Lundy up there. Um, John was an incredibly bright, uh, still is an incredibly bright um, young man from the northeast of England, a local from the Durham parts of the world, uh, who, while we were climbing, used to regale us with extraordinary, extraordinary stuff, given his young years. I don't know how he knew all this stuff, but one of the things he used to tell us about was how scientists get it all wrong and that scientists do all their good work in the first couple of years after they graduate, and then they get promoted to professor and start talking bollocks. <laughs> that wasn't actually the word he used, but that's the word we will go with. Um, and, uh, and he made us all promise that we would never do that. <laughs> and so, to my surprise, here I find myself uh, acutely aware that John is looking on at me, uh, particularly since the other person who used to climb with us, who's down the bottom corner there, uh, David, unfortunately is no longer with us because he died in a climbing accident about five years later. So it's just me and John, and I'm about to break a promise to John and talk about things beyond my area of expertise. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm nervous. Okay, so most of us identify some influential teacher who we think influenced us in, in life. And I was thinking about who is the person who's influenced me in terms of shaping my career, and I decided this is my teacher. Look and learn. Does anyone remember look and learn? <laughs> yes, I had a feeling it might. Um, uh, look and learn was full of fact and fiction, as the slogan used to say. Uh, it was a science and culture magazine for children that started, in, I've been using Google, started in 1962 and went through until 1982, exactly matching my childhood years. And um, I used to read this magazine avidly, and uh, I think it was very influential in forming my views about science and the world. In fact, I still, my family know this, I still often say, yes, I know something because I read it and look and learn. It's kind of a, a saying in our family. It's a measure of the truth of something. Um, so look and learn is my teacher. And um, when I look at these images, some of which I've culled from my personal collection, I still have a collection of look and learns. Um, uh, one of the things that moves me is the beautiful artwork. It's really beautiful. And, that artwork was very important to me because when I was young, uh, growing up, uh, reading and writing were very, very difficult to me, for me. Uh, in fact, I think the reason I liked Look and Learn and the reason it was so important to me was because of the comic book format. I could read this stuff and I could understand it uh, because it wasn't solid blocks of text. Uh, so I still get quite emotional looking at these images. Uh, I think they're wonderful. Uh, they, uh, they remind me of a very sort of exciting period in my life. Uh, and um, uh, I remember the amount of information that um, I learned through uh, reading these pages. Um, they remind me of how exciting it was growing up in the 1960s and early 70s. We used to send a rocket to the moon every few weeks. I mean, how cool is that? Uh, and how sad we don't do it anymore. Uh, and um, uh, so I was reading Look and Learn, uh, and as I say, it was a very important teacher for me, but at the same time, I was really struggling at junior school. I was, um, we, I, amazingly, this is how terrible the schooling I went, uh, I was at, was that I was in a, a streamed junior school, and I was in the B stream because of my poor reading, and in fact, there was talk about moving me into a remedial class, 
uh, because I couldn't read and write. My writing was so bad that the teachers used to rather cruelly refer to me as Rich Arp Chem 9. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so, as I say, look and learn was really important. And um, then something quite surprising happened. We used to have an 11 plus exam in, uh, uh, in England which uh, determined whether you went to grammar school, and I passed. Everyone was very surprised. Some other parents uh, lodged an appeal and asked for a recount. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, but the results seemed to have stuck, and uh, I went to the grammar school. And when I got to the grammar school, a very bright young uh, English teacher, just fresh out of college, uh, uh, sent me off for assessment for dyslexia. What I think is truly remarkable about that is that this was 1972, that she'd even heard of dyslexia and managed to find a psychologist to assess me for dyslexia. It was actually quite remarkable. Uh, but anyway, I was diagnosed, and yes, indeed, it was dyslexia. Uh, and um, that brought me a little bit of breathing space. The, the school got off my back a little bit, and uh, I, uh, I continued to uh, improve in my education to the point where by the time I got to do O-levels, I did rather better than expected. So suddenly the school changed tack and decided that I should go and do medicine. <laughs> I hope you're noticing, by the way, that these carefully selected look and learn pages follow the story. How do you say that? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, they, the school was trying to persuade me of the marvels of medicine. I told the school I wanted to be a research biologist. I was pretty sure what I wanted to do. The school told me that all research biologists started off with a degree in medicine from Oxford, and that's what I should do. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't fall for that one and realized that, uh, that actually um, uh, I was uh, in charge here because all I had to do was fail my exams and they wouldn't be able to send me to Oxford. Uh, so, um, the other thing that I did was I went sailing, and as Peter alluded to, that's something that I still, it's a still a, a strategy in my career these days, if, if the going gets tough, go sailing. So when A-level results were due to come out, I went off sailing and said to my parents, uh, when, I, when, when I don't get into medicine, uh, ring around the university and see if you can find me a place for psychology. It's interesting because I have no idea why I said that, other than possibly that assessment for dyslexia maybe was influential, I just don't know. For some reason I decided they wanted to do psychology. Uh, so they did that and got me a place to study psychology uh, at Durham. I'm afraid that Look and Learn let me down. I couldn't find anything related to psychology for, from Look and Learn. Um, so, but anyway, I did find a picture of Durham University. Um, so, uh, so there I was at Durham University doing a little bit of psychology and quite a lot of climbing with uh, John Greener and colleagues. Uh, and uh, thoroughly enjoying myself and really enjoying psychology. And, and I remember my first lecture in psychology sitting there and thinking, goodness, I have made a good decision. I don't know how I made this decision, but this is going to be a fun uh, trip, and it was. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at Durham University. Um, and then, after I graduated, uh, I couldn't get a PhD place because, let's face it, I'd spent too much time climbing with John Greeno and not enough time studying. So um, I decided I would be a research assistant. And um, my professor at the time, uh, Michael Morgan, uh, um, told me I should apply for a job in London with one of his um, ex-students. The job description said that you needed someone who could program um, personal computers uh, in machine code to run online experiments. This is 1981. Uh, I pointed out to Mike Morgan that I had never even seen a personal computer, never mind programmed one. <laughs> and he did something remarkable. He said, that's all right, I'm going away for two weeks. There's a, a, a PC on my desk, have my office, this is the head of department, have my office and my computer for two weeks and teach yourself programming and write the letter saying you're applying for the job. We did all this, remarkably the plan worked, I managed to program in machine code and I got the job. And actually that was incredibly important for lots of reasons. It, that was provided me with a source of income for many years after that because I was always able to get research work as a research assistant because of my uh, ability to program these newfangled uh, personal computers and to run experiments which increasingly became important in psychological research. Um, in fact, I, not so long ago, had to actively decide to stop programming because it was far too enjoyable and it was not a very useful uh, way for me to use my time. Uh, the other uh, useful thing about uh, computers, which was very important for my career, is that they come with spell checkers. <laughs> and I was going to say that finally this kind of freed me of the remains of dyslexia, but anyone who knows me knows that is not true. <laughs> anyone who's read my emails, um, students still talk about the day when I gave a whole lecture on the psychology of tourism rather than the psychology of terrorism. Um, <laughs> and when I, got, when I got promoted to associate professor, uh, one of my PhD students very kindly wrote to me and pointed out I spelled professor wrong in my email. 
footer. So um, spelling is still a challenge. Uh, anyway, I was working away at my PhD very slowly at University of London, uh, part-time, because I was working as a research assistant. And I used to get a, a, a postcard from Senate House each year. Uh, it didn't say Happy Christmas on it, but that's the best I could do for you. Um, I used to get a postcard from Senate House each year which would say, it's time for you to re-enroll for your PhD. This is your second year of registration. And this used to depress me dreadfully because it would then say your third year of registration, your fourth year of registration. And it felt interminable. I was never going to finish this PhD being part-time. And it was the eighth year of registration, ninth year of registration. Then it came and said, this is your zeroth year of registration. <laughs> <laughs> and it dawned on me that no one had ever thought you might take more than nine years to <laughs> do a PhD. And they'd only reserved a single digit in the computer system. <laughs> for PhD enrollment. So I clocked the system at UCL. So if you ask UCL how long Richard Kemp took to do his PhD, they'll tell you three years. And that is a fiction which I'm very happy to go along with. So, um, oh yeah, one other, sorry, I was also going to mention another influential thing that happened to me at this time was I got called up for jury service. I always talk to students when I'm talking about psychology and law about ju juries, and I always say, if you get called to jury service, do it. Don't get out of it. Everybody manages to wriggle out of jury service. Not only is it a really important part of your uh, duty as a citizen, I think, but it's just fascinating. So I, I served on a jury uh, in a murder case in Chester, and I remember uh, one of the ways it influenced me was it just, uh, I was a very naive middle-class child, and it opened my eyes to the real world when the defendant uh, was asked what time something happened, uh, and he answered he couldn't tell the time. And I remember thinking, I could accept that someone couldn't read, but they couldn't tell the time. What an extraordinary thought. And that, I'm, that influenced me in lots of ways, I think. Um, other important things uh, that happened. So eventually, I finished my uh, PhD in three years. And um, shortly after I finished my PhD, a uh, remarkable research opportunity arose, which also shaped my career in a, in a very significant way. And this was down to an extraordinary kind of chain of weird and wonderful circumstances which is worth relaying because it's just how your life is shaped by strange things. So someone I knew was having an affair with an economist who occasionally worked for a marketing company who, would, who did some work for Barclay Card, the credit card company. Okay, how about that for kind of weird? And um, Barclay Card, the credit card company, were under huge pressure at the time because they were losing lots of money to, to credit card fraud. And everyone was saying, why don't you simply put photographs on credit cards and then there won't be any credit card fraud. And Barclay Card thought they'd, they'll do this. They'll do, they wanted to do some research, but they didn't want it to be done publicly. Uh, they wanted to do it on the quiet. So they were asking around, does anyone know anyone who could possibly do this research? So uh, th this friend of a friend knew that I'd done face recognition research for my PhD. So the job came to me. They asked me to prepare a proposal to do uh, a study for, uh, to investigate whether or not it's worth putting photographs on credit cards. And uh, along with a couple of colleagues, uh, we designed a study which um, has been really in influential both on my career and actually also for this little bit of psychology was kind of born while we literally drew this out, I remember, on the back of napkins at a conference dinner one day, uh, this study. Um, uh, essentially what we did was we um, decided what we would do is get real credit cards made up which had real bank accounts attached to them uh, and people's photographs on them. This is what you can do when you've got a, a, a big bank paying for your research. And uh, we had... Each student had four credit cards made up, one sh which showed them unchanged as they appeared on the day of the experiment, one the same person with a slight change of appearance. So that if you look at the top two uh, images there, for example, that's the same person. Then another uh, card which had um, a different individual from our student cohort. So quite a, a group of about 100 students at most, I think, who we thought looked similar to that person. Okay, and that's the matched foil, as it's called here. And then an unmatched foil, just somebody different. So the top left person, used all four of those credit cards. Yeah. And the, the idea was, let's just go shopping and see what happens. Uh, and that's what we did. Amazingly, I managed to persuade a supermarket um, to allow us to uh, take over their supermarket one night, and we paid for the cashiers to stay behind. Uh, and uh, our students went shopping. And it was, I remember it being an incredibly exciting moment because we realized that we were onto something really quite extraordinary that nobody had expected. In fact, before we did this experiment, I got some criticism from quite a senior psychologist who said I was this was a farce and that we were wasting uh, Barclay Card's money and everybody's time by doing an experiment to see whether you could recognize someone in a photograph. Of course you could. How utterly ridiculous was that? We realized it wasn't going to be that straightforward when we sent the photographs off to the credit card company and they wrote back to us and said that we'd sent them all the wrong photographs because they'd got them all muddled up. And we kind of went, oh, okay, something interesting is happening here. In truth, what happened was that people made all the mistakes you could make. 
uh, uh, people were accepting um, credit cards bearing the photograph of someone else, the matched foil. They would also even accept the photograph of the unmatched foil, the, the one that we thought they would never accept. They also rejected photo credit cards containing the photograph of, of the bearer, but just looking slightly different. Everything went wrong uh, in the most marvelous way. Essentially, what we found was that overall, in this experiment, you only had about 50% chance of detecting fraud. Uh, and it was, that was kind of the birth of a little bit of psychology. Up until then, there'd been a massive amount of research in face recognition, but no one had studied exactly this issue to do with uh, unfamiliar face matching. It's not remembering a face, it's just deciding whether two images are of the same person or not. And um, it uh, attracted quite a lot of publicity. Uh, and um, lots of people talked about its implications to uh, passport control. Um, uh, uh, I couldn't resist showing you this photograph. <laughs> it's interesting that I didn't, I'd forgotten that you could update your passport by adding an extra photograph then. Anyway, um, uh, there was talk about whether or not this applied to passports, and I remember doing some media work and someone from the Home Office ringing up and telling me, don't be ridiculous, we're trained. We know how to do this and don't talk about it. The credit card company decided they didn't want to pursue it any further, and so the whole thing went quiet. And indeed, this little bit of research, I think, would have died at that moment if it wasn't for the fact uh, that um, a few years later, something rather significant happened called 9-11. And suddenly this bit of research became incredibly significant. And I used to get, in the weeks after 9-11, I got several phone calls from mysterious people who wouldn't leave their names but wanted to know more about the research. <laughs> and suddenly this stuff mattered and security. And so it's undoubtedly the case, unfortunately, that my research has benefited from uh, uh, terrorism. Um, and also, around about this time, I moved to Australia, so we're up to about 2001 now, and um, uh, shortly after 9-11, um, met up with the Australian Passport Office. And I want to acknowledge the significance of the Australian Passport Office for my research. Uh, they have been the most fantastic research partners you could ever imagine. That when you do um, applied research, what you really ideally want is a partnership with an organization who recognizes what research is about. Most businesses don't understand the research. They want you to guarantee what the results are going to look like for a start. That, well, it's not research if you can do that. The Australian Passport Office have completely understood the research process and have been incredibly supportive from the very beginning and have funded my research and my research with David White in particular, who's sitting here in this room, who joined me a few years later. He, they've funded our research incredibly generously and in a very supportive way for a number of years. Um, uh, to the point where... Uh, we've boldly said that we're moving towards solving the passport problem. Um, maybe it's a risky strategy to make such a claim, but we've been undertaking research for long enough now that we're beginning to gather together ideas about how we can actually improve the accuracy with which, in particular, Australian Passport Office can detect uh, identity fraud in passport applications. When you submit your photograph, they need to decide, is that you or someone else? Or, in particular, have you previously applied for a passport under a different name? And... Uh, we've identified a whole series of strategies that we can use to improve the ability of the passport office to do that. They're such a good uh, research partner that they're going to do this. Uh, you know, it's the, for a psychologist, that's really quite exciting, the idea that you would suggest something and someone would take it seriously and actually uh, do it. Um, I also have engaged in a whole series of uh, other research projects. Uh, and since I um, arrived in Australia, really what's happened is my research has broadened out enormously, and that's thanks to... Uh, my uh, meeting and working with some fantastic colleagues and, most importantly, some fantastic uh, PhD students. Um, and so I'm just going to very quickly mention those projects and some of the students and colleagues involved in them. But I was thinking that everybody always says PhD students are like children. It's, you know, it's a very commonly uh, made analogy. And I was thinking it's true, but it's true for an interesting reason because, and I think the reason is because you learn from them. That's what actually is in common between children and PhD students. They teach you far more than you ever teach them. And I think this line of research where I'm kind of increasingly broadening out my research interests in the broad uh, psychology and law discipline, I think, illustrates that, uh, that exposure. So, for example, this is one of the research, first research projects I did when I arrived in Australia. We were commissioned by New South Wales Police to um, uh, investigate uh, the inherent requirements of policing. What does it take to be a police officer? And to do this, we got to sit in the back of police cars for, for weeks on end. I remember spending all night driving around the back of a police car, then coming in the next morning and, and teaching uh, in lectures. Um, and I was doing that with a very bright new PhD student I'd taken on called Helen Patterson, who's now a very valued colleague at another university that we won't mention. <laughs> but, um, 
Uh, and uh, th that was an incredibly valuable experience. It taught us an awful lot about police and policing. Uh, and Helen got to be driven around the um, Dubbo Zoo by police officers, I think, if you remember. Um, uh, we, Helen and I also did a lot of work on uh, witness interviewing. It was um, uh, how best to interview witnesses and, and what happens when witnesses talk to each other in particular. Uh, this has led to some uh, really interesting research. Helen has done some great research and I sort of tagged along looking at what happens when witnesses talk to each other, how it changes people's memory for an event. And we've shown that this is a remarkably powerful way to change someone's memory. People will remember things that never happened. You can make people remember total, uh, whole, totally fabricated events just by getting them to talk to someone who they think experienced the same as they did. Uh, and we've shown this to be a, really, a real vulnerability in terms of witness memory. This has led to some really interesting work that we're uh, exploring at the moment. Uh, about how we might tackle this. And we've um, got a really exciting project that Helen's leading, uh, looking at use of technology. And in particular, we've, we're, we're in the process of developing a, a phone app, a smartphone app called iWitnessed. That was my contribution was the name. It was pretty cool, I thought. <laughs> but because it's I, you know, metallic I. Um, uh, um, and the idea is you can use this to uh, record uh, events as they occur. And it w we feel it may be particularly useful for events where there are repeated um, components to an event. So for things like, for example, domestic violence or workplace bullying, events like that, which often witnesses really, really struggle to reliably recall because of the repeated nature of the events uh, and will often give uh, mistaken evidence in court when they're being cross-examined. Um, so uh, with, through the use of this phone app, they can provide information which is recorded and date stamped and time and location stamped. Uh, and so we, we hope that that will be a useful uh, application of our work. Some other work. Every time you look at the $5 note or the new $10 note, I want you to remember uh, the work that I did with David White and Branka Speer and some colleagues from uh, University of Queensland. Uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia asked us to investigate uh, fraud protection measures, which they built into the, this note and indeed actually also the new UK notes, I noticed. Um, uh, this was a good fun project which involved them having to first of all, produce notes for us and then produce the best forgeries they could, which I think they thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and uh, we then had people trying to spot the difference between the two. Um, it was a nice application of perception to uh, a legal pro problem. Uh, Helen also led a big project with New South Wales Fire Brigade, which I and Richard Bryan were involved in as well, uh, looking at um, what happens when uh, people are involved in um, critical incident debriefing. Follow, following a critical incident like a major fire or... Uh, uh, some other emergency service involvement. Um, uh, people are often debriefed in groups, and we were interested in what the impact of that is, both on their psychological well-being, but also on their memories for the events, because of course that could clearly have impacts on, uh, on inquiries, for example. We also did an interesting project with WorkCover New South Wales, uh, the health, uh, Workplace Health and Safety Agency for New South Wales. One thing I discovered about working with work over New South Wales is that it's exactly how you'd expect it to be. <laughs> they're, they're very thorough <laughs> and would, would always point out trip hazards at the start of meetings. Um, uh, but we, managed, we got some very interesting uh, work out of them and, and indeed some of the work from that project actually led into the eyewitness project I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, it also led to some interesting work I did with a PhD student who's gone to the dark side and is working in business called Donna Lee, who did some excellent work on what happens when you lie. If you repeatedly lie about something, for example, if you deny responsibility for some workplace accident, do you come to believe your own lies? It's a really interesting question. No one had really studied it, still haven't studied it terribly satisfactorily. I, I'm not sure what the other psychologists in the room would think. My response to that was, yes, I would definitely expect that you would come to believe your own lies. Turns out it's not that simple at all. It, it works both ways. Yes, to some extent you come to remember and believe your own lies, but also you know that you're lying. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, and this work on witness memory has led to a really interesting project that I'm just starting with um, a student at the moment, uh, Crystal McDonald. We're looking at police body-worn cameras. So you may have heard that this is a very uh, significant rollout that's going on around the world at the moment. More and more police forces are being equipped with body-worn cameras. It's a really interesting question to be asked here, which a very smart New South Wales uh, police officer asked, which is, what happens to that footage, that recording? When do you show it to the police officer? If you want to know what happened or what they think happened, when do you show them the recording? How does it change their memory? Is someone's memory changed by the mere fact that they know the recording device is there? They're all really good questions which we're currently investigating. 
I've also increasingly been working with uh, offender groups, or rather with PhD students who've been working with offender groups um, through my involvement in the Masters of Forensic Psychology program. Uh, and in particular, two PhD students, Jason Ware, who uh, works for Corrective Services New South Wales, who uh, did an excellent project looking at how to treat sex offenders who categorically deny their offence. What do you do if someone just says, I didn't do it? You don't want to leave them untreated and be released uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the public uh, uh, as a risk. If you know treatment reduces risk, then you want to treat them. So how do you go about doing that? And he did some excellent work there, uh, which was just a joy to go along with. And similarly, uh, Kevin O'Sullivan, who did some fantastic work. Uh, unfortunately, Kevin can't be here today, but um, he sends his regards to everybody. He did some wonderful work on um, stopping offending, on what causes people to break the cycle of offending and how they break out of that cycle. And it's typical of Kevin that he should find such an uh, uh, optimistic uh, topic to study. I also have a PhD student within New South Wales Police looking at the relationship between mental health services and police. It's a fact of life these days that police are a frontline mental health service provider. Uh, if someone has a, an acute mental health episode in this state, the first person who's going to deal with them is almost certainly a police officer who has relatively little training. Uh, and New South Wales Police are actually doing a fairly good job of trying to train their officers. Uh, as some people have pointed out, it's not good if you shoot your mental health clients, so, um, and that is a danger with the police. So, uh, uh, so training um, there has been a really interesting topic for research. And I've had uh, another student, Craig Jones, looking at alternatives to conventional um, sentencing, such as uh, the drug courts in New South Wales, trying to break people out of a cycle of, uh, uh, of short prison sentences followed by, uh, as in, in response to drug-related offences, which fo are followed immediately by renewed drug taking and renewed uh, crime to support those offences, uh, and the cycle goes on and on. And there's some really exciting and very positive and clearly well evidence-based alternatives uh, which uh, have a significant impact on people's lives. Uh, another very insignificant part of my research in the last few years has been a, uh, an initiative that colleagues here at UNSW have put together, particularly uh, Gary Edmund at the top there, Mira San Roque, both from law. One of the joys of working at UNSW has been the truly collaborative nature of some of the research I've been able to do with the Faculty of Law. I always thought that that's what university would be like, that you would kind of meet with people from other departments over a beer or a coffee or something, and actually it's really quite rare at universities. The exception, I think, is this collaboration where we really do do that. Quite a lot of beer, actually, when Gary has his way. Um, uh, also with Christy Materi, David White, uh, and other colleagues, uh, Bryn, who is here, um, we uh, have um, been looking at the reliability of forensic science evidence. If you watch the TV, you would think that forensic science evidence is really reliable, and that's what locks people up. Turns out a lot of forensic science evidence is junk science. It, it, most scientists don't believe us when we first tell them that there is that no validation studies for most techniques until a few years ago, fingerprint evidence had never been validated. Turns out it's pretty reliable, which is just as well because we've been using it for 100 years. <laughs> most other forensic science evidence has never been validated. I got involved in this because of this stuff. You can see the relationship between this and, and my face work, that there was evidence being presented in court to try and identify people from photographs either visa photographs, like the example of the woman on the left, or photographs from CCTV of people committing offences. And there's a, a class of uh, expert witness emerged uh, who uh, claim to be able to make these kind of identifications using a variety of techniques, either by taking measurements with a, by drawing lines with a ballpoint pen, uh, or um, by uh, identifying certain characteristics, for example, of the ear uh, from these images, and claim to be able to identify the uh, perpetrator to a very high degree of certainty in these cases. These images remind me of an interesting interaction that happened. I was speaking at a conference Gary had organized where we were uh, trying to persuade the forensic scientists to come on board in an attempt to try and improve the quality of forensic science evidence. And so I decided the line to take with these scientists at the end of the conference was to say, look, you guys are good. You're the good guys. You're all doing good science, good validated science, but you have to accept this junk science out there. Look at this, for example, I said, showing those examples on the left. Look at this junk science. Unfortunately, <laughs> the person who produced that report was sitting in the audience <laughs> and leapt to his feet and saying, are you seriously saying that's, um, are you calling my work junk science? And I said, well, if you're admitting that's your work, then yes, I am. I mean, what else can I say? Uh, Gary stepped in at this point, though, was very helpful. He offered to hold his coat while he hit me. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, 
Um, so, uh, um, uh, I've also been doing, increasingly doing expert evidence in court in relation to that kind of forensic science evidence, offering rebuttal forensic science evidence. And also with regard to memory, increasingly there are some interesting trends in memory research, in, uh, sorry, in memory evidence in court. For example, increasingly witnesses talk about events in relation to social media. Uh, whoever saw that coming? I certainly didn't. I, mind you, I don't have a Facebook account. But um, uh, it, most witnesses these days will tell you a story which in some way involves social media. For example, they've been told something or they learned something through social media. And that has huge implications for memory and memory contamination. Well, this, um, something still to be explored. I also just wanted to make a shout out for the forensic psychology program at, here at UNSW. I'm very proud of this program. Uh, it, when, we, uh, when I arrived in 2001, it was a program in need of some work. Uh, I'm now, uh, I've just handed over to Christy. I know she's gonna do a fantastic job leading that program. And I, I'm very proud of that program. Uh, uh, it's on a very solid basis and that's to a very large extent due to the contributions of other people, particularly Anita McGregor, up at the top there, Kevin O'Sullivan, who I mentioned before, who was also my PhD student, and Christy. Uh, and um, the students who have been presenting their thesis work today here, I think, are a nice illustration of the, 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 the very sound basis of that program uh, today. And I need to thank my lab group. We go on a, um, an expedition each year to uh, Sculpture by the Sea, and we usually manage to find some face-related object to have our photographs taken next to, and you can see that the group, the group changes slightly, but there's some familiar faces each year uh, in those groups. Uh, in particular, as I mentioned before, David White, who uh, has been such an important colleague uh, in recent years. Um, okay, so now, this is the bit where I need to start apologizing to John. So this is the point in the lecture where I meant to tell you something profound, and I thought about it, and I just don't know whether I had anything to profound to say. Then I remembered something that happened. And I thought this kind of maybe there's an, an important lesson here. So I'm looking at Francesca, who will remember this episode. Uh, in 2014, Francesca and I went on a post-HSC uh, trip to India. We did the kind of backpacking tour of India that I wanted to, to do when I was 18 but couldn't afford to. She got to do it with my credit card. It kind of worked out well. <laughs> uh, and we went to uh, Delhi, and we were spending a, We had a spare day in Delhi, and Francesca went online and said, you know, there's a bird hospital in Delhi, in the Jain Temple uh, in Delhi. Uh, and what we particularly liked about the description of the bird hospital was that um, they would only allow raptors in as day patients because they ate the other patients. <laughs> that was it, we were going to go. Um, the, I don't know if you know about the Jain religion, they were particularly lovely people, the Jain. They're vegetarians, we're vegetarians, so I, I like that especially. But they were also extraordinarily caring and loving people who worked very hard for the welfare of other people and other animals. Here is the charity bird hospital. Those are the drop boxes by the front door there. You drop your, your, your injured birds, birds into the drop box. And, um, this is the inside of the bird hospital. It leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of cleanliness. Uh, this is the top on the left there shows Francesca connecting with a volunteer at the bird hospital. They, they, they connected over photographs of pigeon tumors. <laughs> She's studying animal veterinary bioscience, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, uh, there was a lovely exchange where this young man was showing her the, these massive tumors on this pigeon which they'd cut out. And Francesca said, oh my God, and it survived? And he went, no, no, it died. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, what was interesting, though, is that uh, all of the pigeons were suffering from one of two conditions. The one on the top left, my photography wasn't great because I wasn't meant to be taking photographs, but the one on the top left shows uh, something called pigeon paralysis. It's where you get neck paralysis in pigeons and they can't hold their neck up. And the one at the bottom was a bird after it's been treated, that's blood staining all around its head, where they've cut away lesions and like wart-like lesions all over its face and head and in its throat um, uh, without any uh, pain relief, it must be said. Um, so these were really caring people who were doing their absolute best for pigeons that were being brought over from anywhere in Delhi, and they were lovely people. Trouble is, Francesco and I went, went back to the, to the hotel and Googled pigeon diseases, and it takes about 30 seconds to find out what's going on here. First of all, pigeon paralysis is a particularly virulent virus uh, which um, uh, can, can cause 100% mortality in some pigeon lofts, actually can spread to humans and cause some illness in humans, particularly if you come into contact with the feces of pigeons. I'm thinking, I remember walking barefoot around that, <laughs> that pigeon hospital. Anyway, um, uh, and it's, the pigeons spread the disease very rapidly uh, between, uh, between each other. Uh, so clearly, the last thing you want to do is pack 200 pigeons with pigeon paralysis together in a hospital 
and then if they survive, release them. You can see immediately what's going on there, not a good idea. The second disease is this one, pigeon pox, the wet form, apparently. Um, uh, the interesting thing about that is it looks dreadful, but actually it's not so serious. If you leave it alone, the, the sores will clear up and the pigeon will survive, unless it chokes to death, because sometimes the sores block the airways. Otherwise, the bird will survive. So, but that, they're the ones that they were cutting the, the lesions off, and the pigeons were sometimes dying just from the result of the, the cutting. So the point I want to make is that you have these really well-intentioned well people doing the absolute best they can, failing to use Google. <laughs> I think my moral here is... Google has the answer. <laughs> and, and then this is where the bit that I have to apologize to John comes from. I think that leads to a broader conclusion about a sort of a just imagine. Just imagine for a minute, though, if, if law and public policy was actually evidence-based in the way that medicine was, in the way that the pigeon hospital wasn't evidence-based. Just imagine what would the world be like if, when we decided how legislation would work, for example, we actually ask the question, what is it we want to achieve? No, that, for some reason, that's the question asked in medicine. No one decides how to treat cancer on the basis of their feelings about people who have cancer. Uh, instead, they ask the question, what works? But that's never the question we ask in regard to law. Uh, yet, there's plenty of evidence. Any of us with, I would think it might take a bit more than 30 seconds, but any of us with a, few, a couple of days to spend in Google could develop a pretty good policy with regard to all sorts of issues like we could all reduce recidivism in New South Wales dramatically uh, if we just had a couple of days on Google. It's not difficult to do. The evidence is there. It's just never applied. We're in this weird world where it seems that politicians uh, and shock jocks have the right in some way and expect to be able to influence policy on these kind of matters when science is what tells us what works. It's, medicine is the application of science, uh, and uh, it, the notion of evidence-based practice in medicine is so hackneyed, it's just kind of old hat. Yet, when did you ever hear anyone talk about evidence-based public policy or evidence-based law? It just doesn't happen. So this is clearly me breaking John's rule now. I am clearly stepping outside psychology, way outside my comfort zone, and probably talking complete nonsense. But let me just go one step further. Also, I think that sometimes you, uh, we have to be particularly careful when uh, uh, I think good justice is done sometimes when you feel uncomfortable. Uh, and the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse is a good example. The, this uh, commission has, was, uh, has brought out to light some appalling stories of abuse and institutional inactivity in response to that abuse. And there's a tendency to want punitive responses, to want more people to be convicted. Science tells us that is not what you should want. What you should want is more guilty people to be convicted. What you want is sensitivity, uh, to, you, to be able to discriminate people who are guilty and those who are not. And I think that's the danger that our response to, the, to this institution, to this commission and the evidence it's brought forward will be blind uh, and driven by uh, emotion rather than science. Okay, I'm almost finished. I just wanted to show you that photograph because I've shown you a photograph of Francesca. This is a photograph of Penelope and Joseph uh, involved in my only ever piece of developmental re psychology research. I have one paper in developmental psychology. What I learned from that was that life is too short to do developmental psychology. <laughs> Don't do it. It actually, uh, it was a cross-sectional study, but it could have been a longitudinal study. It took so long to collect the data. Um, and with that, uh, I will end there. Thank you very much. Professor Richard Kemp, that was a wonderful lecture, truly fitting to start our series of inaugural lectures. I, when I sit through these lectures, I try and make some notes, and I've filled quite a lot of space. So I'm in danger of giving the lecture back again. And I won't do that, but it, it, it was so wide-ranging. We started off with mountaineering, sailing, and bollocks. <laughs> I won't say that we got any bollocks later on in the lecture. Um, look and learn. Yeah, I, I wonder how many people owe their future to look and learn. That's a good research project. That was wonderful, but it did... That the the, the uh, moment when you told us about the teacher who really influenced your life by picking up on dyslexia, 
was fantastic. And that connected later on to your great work in teaching and seeing you with the students. Um, really wonderful. Your spell checkers, the naive, the naive defendant. No, you being naive because you hadn't realised that some people couldn't tell the time. Are you sure? Did the defendant get off? Because are you sure you weren't naive that the defendant was just using that in order to try and get off? I wondered about that. Uh, passport control, police psychology, New South Wales fire, the $5 note, witness psychology, police and mental health. Does Donald Trump believe his own lies? <laughs> what a wonderful lecture. It really was terrific. And you know, in the end, I was just sitting there thinking the lecture really just got across beautifully your intellect, your caring nature, your thoughtful approach, um, your love of science and your love of life and, and your sense of humour. It was wonderful. So, Professor Richard Kemp, thank you for a wonderful lecture and I invite you all to congratulate him once again. Official proceedings over. Everyone is invited to join us for drinks and nibbles in the foyer. Please do join and enjoy the occasion. Thank you very much for being here.